Welcome to the technological companion to the video lesson for random sampling from distributions with applications to Markov chain simulations. In this technological companion, we'll revisit some of the examples from that video lesson. In particular, we'll implement two examples of randomly sampling from probability distributions, but in MATLAB with the aid of the RAND sample and the bino -rand, uh, random number generator function. We'll also spend a little bit of time exploring how technology like MATLAB could conceivably implement those random sampling and random number generation functions. We won't reproduce their exact approach, but we'll, we'll develop a proof of concept that should hopefully shed some light on how randomly sampling from a distribution or randomly generating numbers that are distributed according to a dis distribution uh, works in, in, in principle. Finally, we'll apply these techniques of randomly sampling from a distribution to simulating the dynamics of a Markov chain. Well, it turns out that MATLAB makes it pretty easy to sample from probability distributions. And it gives us two different ways to accomplish this task that we'll look into first. And then for those that are interested in going the extra mile, we'll implement our own random number generator and use it to develop our own random sampler that will allow you to reproduce the same examples that we begin with. So our first elementary example, we're just going to form a theoretical discrete distribution over three possible values for some random variable. For definiteness, we'll let those values that the random variable can take on, they're going to be 0, 1, and 2 but the probabilities of observing those values are going to be 0 0.2, 0 0.5, and 0 0.3, respectively. And that's what defines the values of the theoretical distribution itself. And we'll store those probabilities in an array that we assign to the distribution name f. Next, we're going to collect a sample of 25 values taken from the set of possible values of the random variable, 0, 1, and 2, but distributed according to our, our distribution. And since f isn't a standard known distribution, we're going to use MATLAB's rand sample function. And what it expects from us is the range of values that we're sampling from, so 0, 1, and 2, the number of values we wish to sample, 25, True specifies that we are sampling with replacement, which is what we want to do in this case. And F is the set of probability values that define the, the distribution. And we've already defined F. Okay. So those two lines of code are all it really takes to sample from some arbitrary distribution if you know the probabilities of that discrete distribution. And just to see how that looks, how good of a job our sampling process does of producing data that appears to be distributed according to this distribution. We'll look at some code here that produces a histogram based off of the random sample x and then compares that histogram to a bar graph of our probability distribution values. Now, to make those two comparable, we're making sure that our histogram is using the probability density function normalization, and so that causes it to plot relative frequencies of the data points in our sample. So if we put those three blocks of code together and run our section, you should see that we'll generate an array that contains sequence of values sampled from our distribution, and then we've got our two histograms that show some reasonably good agreement for the small data set that we're working with. Peaks are pretty well aligned. The tails are at comparable heights. The blue bars represent the histogram, the, the empirical re relative frequency histogram of our sampled data, 
while the orange bars are the true probabilities defined by f in our theoretical distribution. So overall, it appears that the data that we've sampled, the, the um, blue bars, are somewhat representative of the distribution that we're sampling from, and that, that's exactly what we'd expect. Now, you can get a lot of mileage in MATLAB using the RAND sample function, but if you would like, and you're working with a known probability distribution that you want to sample from, there's, there's another option that's available. And just about every known distribution, every built-in distribution in MATLAB has a corresponding built-in random number generator. So for instance, if we wanted to randomly sample 25 numbers from the binomial distribution with parameters n equals seven trials and p equals 0.67 is the probability of observing a preferred outcome on any one given independent Bernoulli trial, then all we need to do to create that random sample is to use the binorand function. And binorand is going to take on a set of parameter values. First of all, you need to specify the parameter values for the distribution itself, n and p, which we've already defined as 7 and 0.67. And then we need to describe the shape of the data set that we're trying to produce. And in this case, I want a data set that consists of one row and 25 columns. So essentially, I've got a row vector of 25 samples long of binomially distributed random numbers. And that's all it would take to create that, that random sample from the binomial distribution. Now, I could go through the same steps as before in order to create comparative histograms of the relative frequency of the data points that appeared in our data set versus the theoretical histogram of the binomial distribution. And that's essentially what this block of code does here. So if I wanted to see what those results look like, all I've got to do is run my section. So x now contains my binomially distributed random numbers. Here's an excerpt of them displayed here so far. I can click on it and you know, I can get essentially a spreadsheet that shows me all of the numbers that are sampled. And then my comparative histograms. We can see, once again, the blue bars represent the sampled data, the relative frequencies anyway, and the orange bars represent the probabilities of observing x equals 0, 1, 2, all the way up to 7 um, preferred outcomes out of 7 uh, independent Bernoulli trials. So overall, the agreement looks reasonably decent, kind of like we would expect, and this is a perfectly adequate way of sampling from a known distribution. As I said, there's a associated random number generator function for just about every um, built-in probability distribution that MATLAB has, and it really just is a matter of going to the documentation to understand how to use it, but generally speaking, you just need to specify the parameters of the distribution first, and then the shape of the data set that you want to generate second. That's going to be a pattern that you'll follow for just about any of the random number generators that MATLAB has. So that makes sampling from a known distribution fairly simple. This next example is a little bit on the theoretical side, and it's definitely not required in order to do well with probability and statistics, but it addresses the question of what's really going on underneath the hood when you're using MATLAB functions like RANSample or BINORAND to sample from a distribution. I'm going to only answer this question in principle. I'm going to show one way you could implement functions like RAND sample and BINORAND. Uh, this isn't necessarily what MATLAB is actually doing, but conceptually it's, it's the right idea. And so the, the, the question really arises is, what's going on when you're sampling from a distribution? And we're going to revisit our simple three-state probability distribution f from an earlier example that described the variation of a random variable that could take on just three values, 0, 1, and 2, 
with probabilities of 0 0.2, 0 0.5, and 0 0.3 respectively. Now, a way in principle that you could approximate sampling from that distribution is to create a very large data set, a population of values that you know to be distributed according to F. What I'm going to do is create an array of 1,000 data points and the first 200 data points, the first 20% are going to be zeros. The next 500 data points, so the next 50% are going to be ones and the remaining 300 data points or the last 30%, those are going to be twos. And that is a data set that is not very interesting. It's sorted, but by constructing it with the proportions of zeros, ones, and twos that I have, it's going to be ensured to be distributed according to our distribution F. So we're going to treat that as an approximation to a large population that we would sample from. And now, if I could somehow devise a way to randomly sample from that population with replacement, then that's essentially sampling from the distribution. And so the way I would do that is I would need to come up with um, a scheme, an algorithm for randomly generating integer indices that say like, for instance, the index 1 would say, I want to sample the first entry from our population. Or uh, 27 would say, I want to sample from the 27th entry of our population. So I want to come up with a way of generating random integers in the range 1 through 1,000 to specify which numbers from that population are going to go into my sample. And that's going to require a algorithm called a linear congruential generator. And we'll get into seeing how that works first, or we'll get into seeing how that works in a minute. But first, what we should probably do is run our code that's going to generate our population. And so all I have to do in order to do that is specify the population size of 1,000. I'm going to specify a sample size of 25 now because later on I'm going to want to collect a sample of size 25 from this population randomly. Respecify my probability distribution. And this block of code here just ensures that I'm creating uh, values that go into my data set um, according to the proportions that I said earlier. So I'm going to have 200 zeros, 500 ones, and 300, uh, 300 twos going into that array. So we'll run this block of code to generate our population. And all of the output is suppressed. Can't really see that the population um, has been um, established yet in MATLAB, but if we look over in our workspace, we do see that we've got a one row, thousand column array containing our, our, our values. In fact, if I wanted to look and see what some of those values were, I could just hit D down here in the command window and see that I've just got this big array of a bunch of twos, ones, and zeros. Anyway, We've created our population that we're going to sample from. Now we've got to get to the part that makes our sampling random. So I'm going to establish this linear congruential generator for creating a set of k random indices ranging from 1 to 1,000, so 1 to n. So k is going to be 25, ultimately. I'm going to create a sample of size 25 of numbers ranging from 1 to n, and they're going to be uniformly distributed, meaning each value that I sample or generate is going to occur with the same probability as any other number that I could generate. And they're going to be um, taken with replacement, so I could see repetitions with this generator. So here's how it's going to work.
the linear congruential generator is going to take any starting value for just initial value for some integer i. And then I'm going to multiply that value of i by some coefficient. In this case, I'm going to choose that coefficient to be kind of an obscure number, 48,271. I didn't invent that number, and it actually just turns out to be one that works well, and it's used in a, another software package. Then I'm going to add a step to that result. And in general, that step could be any value, but for this particular example, that step is going to be zero. So all I'm doing is taking my initial value for this integer i and multiplying it by my coefficient a of 48,271. And then I'm going to reduce that modulo sum integer m. Now what that means is that I'm going to take whatever this value, a times i plus c, turns out to be, I'm going to take that and divide it by m, and then pick up the remainder. That's what it means to reduce a quantity by uh, a modulus of m. So I've taken that remainder, and I'm going to set that equal to my new updated integer value. And then I can recursively iterate this process, take that value, multiply it by a, add the step, and then reduce modulo m to get a new integer, and so on. And what I will end up getting is a sequence of numbers that appear to be distributed randomly and uniformly over the range 1 through, in this case, 1 through the modulus, or 0 through the modulus minus 1 to be, to be more precise. Once I've generated those, those numbers, they're, they're, they're random integers over some range, all I've got to do is reduce those numbers modulo my, my population size, modulo 1,000. And that's going to ensure that everything is going to fall in the range, well, it would actually fall in the range 0 through 999. So what I should do is add 1 to that result. So what I'm getting at is that this block of code, if I run it, will generate a set of integer indices that are all confined in the range 1 through 1,000. The reason why that's useful is that this 42, for instance, says sample the 42nd entry from my population. This one says sample my 112th entry from the population. This one says sample the 614th entry from the population, and so on. So I can use these as indices to select elements out of my population array. And that's precisely what I do down here. And it's going to give me 25 values selected randomly from my population. After that, I can look and see if those values seem to compare reasonably well with the predicted relative frequencies by my probability distribution f, and I'm going to do that in the same way. I'm going to write a histogram for the sample, and then I'm going to compare that histogram to a bar graph for the theoretical distribution. So if I run that code, you can see that it just really turns out to be a roundabout way of randomly sampling from our original simple distribution f, and it looks like the agreement between the sample data, the blue bars, and the theoretical probability distribution is pretty good. So this is an approach that works. It's overkill. It's not something that you would need to implement yourself if you are actually are working in MATLAB, but this is conceptually more or less the kind of thing that's going on when you use a function like rand sample or bino rand. Once you've learned how to sample randomly from a probability distribution, or equivalently, generate random numbers that you know to be distributed according to that distribution, then you might want to know why you should care about being able to do that. There's a number of applications that are important. One of them that I use a lot is that I 
generate random numbers according to probability distributions so I can make up data sets that simulate the results of measurements, um, simulate the results of scientific experiments where data is being produced according to some known probability distribution. Because then I can take that data and do things like hypothesis testing or parameter estimation or just statistical inference, all of these techniques that we're going to see our study of probability and statistics culminate in. Another more present application of being able to sample from a probability distribution is to return to our Markov modeling examples and try to use them to simulate the time series of states that you'd be expecting to see in a system that can be modeled by a Markov model, specifically a discrete time Markov model. So we should review some of what we have already learned about Markov models and, and uh, Markov chains before we go on. So we're going to begin by reviewing how we define a transition matrix for a Markov model that describes succession dynamics um, in three classes of vegetation that can dominate a patch of land over time. So remember we let p of x of t equal 1, p of x of t equal 2, and p of x of t equal 3 represent the probabilities that a patch of land is dominated by each of these three possible states at time t. These represented shrubs, grasses, and bare ground. We increment time forward from time t by a discrete step to t plus 1 and predict the probabilities p of x sub t plus 1 equals 1, p of x sub t plus 1 equals 2, and x sub t plus 1 equals 3. These are the probabilities that the patch of land are, is going to be dominated by each of the three states at time t plus 1. But we don't want to predict those probabilities in an absolute sense. We want to predict them conditionally, given knowledge of the same probabilities at time t. And we do this by invoking the law of total probability, and we've seen this in a previous example. And that law of total probability is something that could be more conveniently written in matrix notation. And that matrix in this matrix form of our, of our model is what's known as the transition matrix. Its columns are probabilities that must sum to 1. And for instance, valid values might be given by this matrix here, where the first column is 0 0.7, 0 0.14, and 0 0.16. Those sum to 1. The second column is 0 0.25, 0 0.63, and 0.12. Those sum to 1. And the third column is 0 0.11, 0 0.04, and 0.85. Those also sum to 1. Let's go ahead and run that section of code. Get that transition matrix entered into MATLAB's memory. Because the transition matrix provides the place where we're going to be sampling from distributions in order to simulate a Markov chain, in order to simulate the time series of states that's predicted by a Markov chain. Here's the interpretation. This first column of the transition matrix represents the probabilities that if you begin in state 1, if you begin in a shrub state, these are going to be the probabilities that you stay in a shrub state, move to a grass state, or move to a bare ground state. Whereas the second column says if you begin in a grass state, what's the probability that you will transition to a shrub state, or a grass state, or a bare ground state? And then likewise, the third column represents the probabilities of beginning a, in a grass state, or a bare ground state rather, and transitioning to shrubs, grasses, or staying in bare ground. And so these are the numerical probabilities that we've defined in the transition matrix M. So that's where sampling from a distribution comes from, because each column is a simple distribution. And so the way we're going to simulate a Markov chain is that we'll randomly take an initial state that our patch of land is in. 
Maybe it's in the grass state. That would be state two. So if you're in state two initially, that says go to the second column of your transition matrix, and then you know that you will have a 25% chance of transitioning to the shrub state, 63% chance of remaining in the grass state, and a 12% chance of transitioning to bare ground. So you sample a one, two, or three from that probability distribution defined by the central second column of the transition matrix, and that will give you the next state in your, in your time series. Well, then you just repeat the process. Whatever that state is will dictate which column you sample from in order to get your next state in the time series. Well, here's how that works. We're going to simulate a time series that is 45 steps long. We already know that we're working with three states, state one, two, and three, representing shrubs, grasses, and bare ground. And then we're going to just randomly choose an initial state using the random integer or rand i uh, function of, of MATLAB to choose a number ranging from one, two, or three. And then I'm going to loop over my, my steps of my time series, sampling from the appropriate column of the transition matrix in order to get the next state in my time series. And I'm going to append that next state of my time series to the end of an array of states that I've been keeping track of all along. So let's see what that block of code does for us. We'll run that section. And it doesn't do anything visible yet because I've suppressed the output, but we have created a time series vector, TS. You can see it contains 46 entries in it, and that's the initial state plus the 45 new states that we got through iteration. If I wanted to look at that, I could just enter it into the into the the um, command window, and we see that I've got a column vector of various ones, twos, and threes. Looking at the column vector isn't too terribly instructive, so really the next thing that's really important to do is to visualize it. So I'm going to plot that time series and put some labels on it to you know, describe what is represented by the time series. We'll see what it looks like. So we'll run that, that section. We've got a plot that we can blow up. Bring it into view for you. And we can see what we've got. We've got a time series that stays in the bare ground state for a while, dips down to grasses for one observation, goes back to bare ground for a while, dips down to grasses, goes back to bare ground, and dips down finally to shrubs. So we're seeing succession from state to state to state in this implicitly stochastic way. It's typical of what we would see a time series that's modeled by a a Markov chain is going to do. So that's it. That's really all there is to simulating a Markov chain, and in principle we could do this whether there's three states or 30. It just is going to require us to define a larger transition matrix in order to accomplish that kind of a simulation. That brings us to the end of this technological companion. Thank you for watching, and I hope you found it useful. I also hope that you'll join us again on our next video lesson.